Welcome everyone, Anthony Sequera here with Stormwind.com and the Cisco Learning Network, and I am thrilled that you are joining us for this three-part series on IPv6 for CCNAs. Here in this first part of the series, I'll set up what we're going to be discussing in the three parts, and we're going to explore exactly why IPv6 is such a hot topic. Why are we moving to this new suite of IP protocols, and what's so exciting about IPv6? In the second series, we'll dissect IPv6 addressing, and in the third series, we'll round it out with a look at various technologies that are needed to smoothly migrate and to smoothly implement IPv6 technologies. This three-part series is going to do something magical. It's going to cover everything you need to know from a CCNA perspective on IPv6. Why this is so important is because students often struggle with the vast scope of IPv6 that they could learn. They don't know where to kind of cut it off their studies from a CCNA perspective. So we'll gain that knowledge that we need for CCNA, and this will build a nice foundation for us if we're interested in taking our IPv6 knowledge to the CCNP or maybe even the CCIE level. To get us started here, we're going to jump right in and we're going to discuss why IPv6 is so remarkably exciting. So let's go ahead and get started as we discuss transitioning to an IPv6 world. Now at this point, one thing that's pretty common knowledge about IPv6 is that it is all about a bigger address space. How much bigger? Well, due to the shortage of IPv4 addresses, the people that make up this stuff said, look, there is no way we want to run into this again in our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes. So we're going to take the address from 32 bits in length, which of course we know is conveniently represented in dotted decimal notation, and we're going to move that address space to 128 bits. Now, the difference between 32 bits and 128 bits doesn't seem like all that much, but mathematically, when you increase the address space by that much, remarkable things happen to the number of addresses. Up here, you had roughly 4 billion possible addresses. Down here, you have like 4 billion for every centimeter of the Earth's surface. It is a remarkably massive address space. They'll only give out about 10% of it in our lifetimes. It's so huge. So something happens now when you move to an address that's that big. Dotted decimal is not going to cut it for representing the address. So as you can see, the IPv6, that huge address space, each address will be represented in hexadecimal. Obviously, in the second part of this series, where we dissect IPv6 addresses, we'll need to revisit exactly how hex works and what this big, long, ugly address actually means from a binary perspective. So, the first major revolutionary thing about IPv6, yes, indeed, it is a bigger address space. And this bigger address space means that we won't have to deal with the band-aids that were applied to an IPv4 world, like network address translation. This great band-aid used in conjunction with private RFC 1918 addresses did wonders for holding off the address shortage, but in a V6 world, we won't need anything like that because there are going to be plenty of addresses for you, for your dog, for your cat, for your refrigerator, for your car, for your cell phone. You get the idea. With the larger address space comes a lot of nice features. For instance, the feature of auto configuration. Wouldn't it be nice to have a router go ahead and shoot down to a PC? That PC's network portion of their IPv6 address, and wouldn't it be nice to have the PC calculate its own host portion? 
This is exactly what can happen in IPv6. Notice DHCP in this case is not used at all like we would traditionally know it for giving a machine its IP address. Wouldn't it be nice to have a situation in place where routers can easily push new IPv6 addressing schemes down to their clients? This is exactly what can happen with this larger new address space. But it doesn't end there. There are tremendous enhancements in IPv6 for the area of security and mobility. For example, we know that IP security, IPsec, is a wonderful kind of add-on that we can do with IP version 4. In an IP version 6 world, the support of IP security is mandatory. It is there. If your device professes to use IPv6, your device is going to be IPsec capable. The two are one and the same. How about mobility? The ability to keep your address no matter where you travel in the network infrastructure. Tremendous improvements were made in these areas. So we're beginning to see it's a lot more than just the address space. They also said, you know what? They, being the creators of IPv6 technology, they said, you know what? Let's take this opportunity to simplify things. Let's make routing more efficient. Let's improve performance and scalability. Let's completely eliminate broadcasts. Yeah, if we need to send something to everybody, let's do it using a multicast that is addressed to all nodes, but let's get rid of this reliance on constant broadcasting out to all devices. So, a lot of operational improvements were made in the protocol, and we love that, obviously. Now, here's the deal. They can't send out a memo that says, attention, everyone, next Tuesday at 5 p.m., the internet is shutting down. We'll be down for about 48 hours as we roll out IPv6. Yeah, can't do that, can you? So what we need is we need a solution that'll give us a smooth transition. We need specifically, we need to be able to take islands of V6, right? And we need to be able to connect those islands over a massive sea of V4 only. Yeah, we need this capability. In fact, this is a look at what really is going to happen out there. We probably in our lifetimes will never see the end of V4. We'll just see pockets of V4 getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and we'll be moving V6 through these V4 seas, uh, if you will. Again, islands of V6 and a sea of V4. We'll use transition mechanisms like all kinds of tunnels in order to move that traffic through that V4 only environment. So we'll talk more about these transition mechanisms in our third part of this series. So in this first part of the series, we took a look at well, exactly what we'll be doing in the three-part series. And then we also examined exactly why we're so excited about IPv6. Sure, the address space is gargantuan, and that's a wonderful thing, but that's not the only compelling reason to make a move to an IPv6 world. We have improved efficiencies, we have absolutely great capabilities like auto configuration and easy renumbering of networks and the elimination of NAT and the elimination of broadcasts. And we have improved features like security and mobility. All of this with an engineering of a smooth transition. In fact, your devices, they're ready to go these days as far as IPv6 goes. I mean, they're totally ready. You talk about transition richness. If we do show run interface fast ethernet zero slash zero in this router, we'll see it is a completely unconfigured interface. Nothing going on there. But if I go interface fast ethernet zero slash zero, IPv6 enable, guess what? We just 
enabled the V6 stack on this particular machine, and this particular machine, show IPv6 interface brief, this particular machine does indeed now possess an IPv6 address in which it can communicate locally on that fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 segment. So, wow, the IPv6 world is indeed upon us. And I hope you'll join me in part two of this series where we will dissect that IPv6 address and make sure we fully understand the ins and outs of V6 addressing.